morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on such a chilly Saturday morning. I don't know about you, but I'm really shocked at how the weather is changing so quickly. I know it's almost December. It's, oh, actually, a couple of ways to go yet, yeah, but thank you for coming out this morning for a really important topic. We're so glad to be able to share with you some of the latest in terms of treatments for prostate cancer to be able to answer your questions. Uh, I'm CEO of The Gathering Place, Michelle Serenian. We are so pleased to be able to uh, present this program to you today. As I'm certain all of you know, the mission of The Gathering Place is to support, educate, and empower individuals and families currently coping with the impact of cancer in their lives through programs and services provided free of charge. And that's what's really important. We want anyone on their cancer journey to be able to have access to any of the support services they need in partnership with their medical teams. So thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues who have done such an incredible job of planning this morning for you today. I wanna to thank all of our presenters and I wanna thank our sponsors. I know Ellen will be doing that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But thank you so much, enjoy the program. Please be sure to uh, you know, ask your questions. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I know a lot of you. I'm Mary Bornstein, I'm one of the program staff at The Gathering Place, and again, I welcome you, and I'm really glad that you're here, and boy, am I glad we could do that this, this year in person. Um, so, uh, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, one is, probably some of you have seen this, but there are two ways out, the back door and the side door, and the bathrooms are way to the right. There is a closet if you wanted to, I see a lot of you don't have coats, but if you wanted to hang them, that is to the left. Um, I want to thank Davis Bakery because they are supplying all the food. Hi, Nat. <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the past, um, the site center has been very generous in giving us this facility to use every other year for this program. And they have done that again. However, minus the food because of COVID. <laughs> so the cafeteria here is not open. So we brought food in and I wanted to again thank um, Davis Bakery. Um, I also want to thank the site center and Margaret who is not here today because she's been our liaison. I especially want to thank Rob who's back there behind the camera uh, for being our tech guy. And uh, that is really important. And so something we're doing this year is a little different we are recording all these sessions with the physicians so that we'll be able to either put it on our website, I don't know why I have this on, put it on our website or uh, put it on YouTube. So that will be coming out. So um, you know that we have limited capacity because of COVID, so people that couldn't come today will be able to hear all of the talks. And the talks are gonna be pretty amazing. We have some amazing physicians from the clinic in UH. Um, and then lastly, I want, to, I want to tell you a couple things about your folder. In your folder, you have two index cards. Um, we have more if you need them, but those are for questions. So the team and myself, who I'm going to introduce, um, will be coming up and down the aisles and collecting those cards for, present, you know, for questions um, for, the, for the physicians. So please write your questions you know, down. If you need more index cards, we have them. Also in the packet, I'm really happy this year, we have the schedule, 2022 schedule for Prostate Partners meetings this year, both east side and west side. Same topics, east side and west side. Uh, when we go to in person, it will be um, different speakers on each side of town. So I think a lot of you know we've been meeting on the east side only um, in person for several months. Before that, we were meeting virtually. So we're hoping to uh, be able to meet in person um, on both sides of town uh, with speakers. But I'm really happy to have the 2022 schedule in there. Um, so now I'm gonna introduce the team. Um, so I am on the east side most of the time in Beechwood and my partner in the, uh, the Prostate Partners group is Sandy Weinberg. And a lot of you know Sandy. Um, <laughs> and uh, then on the west side, um, there, my counterpart is Erin Rafter, who's at the back of the room. And her partner at, on the west side is Bill Ember. Um, and then we also have, I don't know where he is. Oh, Bill Stone. 
who also helps us and brought in, you can put your hand up, and, <laughs> and, and brought our breakfast this morning, yay Bill. Um, and then we have um, someone that is near and dear to our hearts, Sue Flick, who is a ner clinical nurse practitioner from University Hospitals uh, in urology. A lot of you know her, and she helps us every single year with this. And she will be, uh, we will be collecting the index cards, giving them to her to ask questions of the physicians. So thank you, Sue. So now I'm going to introduce Ellen Heyman who is one of my colleagues at The Gathering Place. Um, she runs a lot of the groups, and she used to actually run the Prostate Partners Group, um, and she's going to introduce the sponsors. Hi, everyone. So I'm so grateful to our sponsors. You can see them listed here. And when I contact, contacted them, they all said yes, immediately. So thank you so much. We couldn't have done it really without them. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Eric Klein, and I think many of you know Dr. Klein. Dr. Klein has been the chairman of the Glickman Urologic and Kidney Institute since 2008. And he's a renowned in the um, area of prostate cancer. And he's also known for the many advances that he's initiated, as well as the compassionate way that he interacts with his patients. Um, whenever we call Dr. Klein to do something at the gathering place, he also says yes. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you. I was asked to give a high-level overview of what the state of prostate cancer is in 2021, and that's what I'm going to do. One of my mentors told me that the only advantage to getting older is gaining perspective, and I suspect that'll resonate with many of you in the audience here, and I'm going to try and share a 30-year perspective with you, thank you, um, of what I've seen in prostate cancer and where we are now. I will uh, leave some time for questions also, and I just say I have another commitment that starts right after this, so I'm not going to be able to hang around for the day. Um, uh, and uh, I've got to leave right about 10 o'clock, so if you have questions, please be sure to get them in before then. So this is where prostate cancer is today. It is the number one cancer in terms of incidence after skin cancer, after non-melanoma skin cancer in men um, having surpassed lung cancer many years ago. About a quarter million new cases this year and about 34,000 deaths. And this is a sobering number. I put this together now. One in two of all of us, well, probably many of you in the room probably have cancer, but one in two of all of us in the United States are going to get cancer sometime, some sort in our lifetime. That's a pretty sobering number. The good news is that the cure rates for cancer in almost every disease have really improved over the decades, and I'll show you the data for prostate cancer. You can see the lifetime risk for prostate cancer is the second line there. It's one in eight. So these are the incidence rates. We saw this huge spike back here in the late 80s when I started my practice due to PSA detecting a lot of cancer, and then uh, it has fallen, and it's on the uptick again, and we're not sure why that is. This probably represents the uh, government's prohibition against screening uh, a few years ago where we stopped screening or primary care physicians stopped screening and the incidence rate went down. This may just be a rebound now that we have recognized that screening works, screening saves lives. There isn't any controversy about this anymore. You can see that the average age at diagnosis is 67. We do see some men in their 40s. It's rare, but we do see it. And we see men uh, older than that. And so I'll bring your attention uh, on this slide, which is death rate due to prostate cancer, to this number first, which is the average age of death of prostate cancer is 80. 
So if you just look at the difference in the average age at diagnosis and the average age at death in men from prostate cancer, this cancer has a long natural history. I know that everybody wants to live forever and that some people believe, like Mike Roizen believes, that we ultimately will get there. I'm not so sure of that. But this cancer doesn't kill people rapidly. And I'll show you the progress that we've made uh, in, the, in the course of the last 30 years. And this is the death rate due to prostate cancer. And so even though the incidence went up and then came down, the death rate continues to fall. And the reason that the death rate continues to fall is that we understand the biology of this cancer a lot better than we did 30 years ago. And there are lots of new great treatments that prolong life. That's an important message that you all need to hear. Getting prostate cancer is not the death knell that it was when I started my practice. So this is real progress on this slide. This is trends in five-year survival rates starting back in 1975 when I was in college. And you can see here that we've made substantial progress in the survival rates, five-year survival rates for prostate cancer. Okay, when I started my practice right around here, about 20% of our patients died within five years. That was pretty discouraging. That's no longer true. I haven't seen a patient die from prostate cancer in probably more than a decade now, someone newly diagnosed with early stage disease. Here's what's really remarkable to me. Look at all the other cancers that occur that are common and look at their five-year survival rates as of 2016. There are none that are better than prostate cancer. So as a man, if you're gonna get a cancer, get prostate cancer. It's pretty easy to treat and you will still live a long time and have a decent quality of life. I know that no one has a choice about that. Now, there is one caveat here, and the caveat here is that if you are newly diagnosed with metastatic disease at the time you were diagnosed, the five-year survival rate is 30%. It's not 100%. But what's remarkable in the middle here is that these are men who present with uh, lymph node metastases in the pelvis. And there was a time when we didn't, if we started doing a radical prostatectomy, we would check the lymph nodes by frozen section in the operating room. If the pathologist told us there was cancer in the lymph nodes, we would not take out the prostate. And those patients would die within five years because they didn't get enough treatment. We don't do that anymore. We recognize now that even if there's some cancer, limited amount of cancer outside the prostate in the pelvis, that aggressive treatment with surgery and hormones and radiation can save lives, and it does, 100% of these people. And I even have a living example here in the audience who I won't point out to you that I operated on more about 30 years ago now, I think, and 30, he identified himself 30 years ago exactly. <laughs> Nat Cook is the guy. We used to stop and not take out lymph nodes. Nat had a positive lymph node 30 years ago. There he is right here alive and well, and it's done a lot for the organization. So, yeah, good for you now. Yeah. Here's the other good news. In 1989, when I started my practice, the five-year survival rate for men with metastatic disease was 0%. So now it's 30%. So, you know, perspective is everything. As a clinician, 30% represents real progress. As a patient, if you're newly diagnosed with metastatic disease, 30% doesn't sound so good, but it's a lot better than it used to be. One caveat here, I wanna make this very clear. If you start with localized disease and no evidence of metastasis, and have radiation or have your prostate out, and five or 10 years later, you get metastatic disease, your survival is better than 30% at five years. That has a different biology to it. So this is real progress that we've seen in 30 years. There are, this is a challenge, I think, and this is where the gathering place comes in. It's just it's so important. I was talking about this um, just before the program started. There are almost 4 million men who have survived prostate cancer who are alive in the United States now. That's equal roughly to the population of Los Angeles. So there's a whole major metropolitan area of men with prostate cancer now, and that raises survivorship issues. All treatments have side effects. People ask, what's the best treatment for my cancer? And they're asking two questions. One, which has the best cure rate? We'll talk about that a little bit. And then they ask, which has the fewest side effects? The answer to the second question is none of the above. They all have side effects. And so survivorship and treating side effects is an important issue. The gathering place serves very, very well 
your needs, your emotional needs, your intellectual needs, guidance for getting treatment for side effects and so forth, and I really would encourage you to continue to engage this organization for that kind of support. This is um, a growing burgeoning need as people live longer and uh, as more and more treatments come online and we discover new and interesting side effects and so forth, this is really an important issue that needs to be addressed. All right, let's talk about screening. Again, there is no question that screening for prostate cancer saves lives. The European screening trial showed that the men who were screened with PSA were 35% less likely to die of prostate, excuse me, 27% less likely to die of prostate cancer 15 years later and 35% less likely to get metastatic disease. So tell your young relatives who are men that they need to be screened for prostate cancer. PSA is still the backbone of what we do. There are some new what we call germline genetic tests that measure the genes that you're born with that indicate what your lifetime risk of prostate cancer is that will be coming online in the next few years that will help determine who really needs to be screened and how often they need to be screened, but screening works. So PSA is terrific, except when it isn't. The problem with PSA is that it's prostate specific, but it's not prostate cancer specific. And so most men who have an elevated PSA, in fact, don't have prostate cancer. In the past, that has led to too many biopsies, which cause, you know, it's, it caused some local side effects or uncomfortable, can cause serious life-threatening infections, that sort of thing. The whole field of urology has been dedicated in the last, I would say, 15 or 20 years to figure out ways to, to minimize that risk so that we don't subject men who have negative biopsies, uh, excuse me, we don't subject men who aren't likely to have cancer to biopsies and so that um, we don't cause side effects with biopsy. We really only want to biopsy men where we're likely to find a cancer. That's really the goal, that's what we want to get to. There are a number of tests on the market already that can reduce the need for biopsy. Let me say that in a different way. They have better sensitivity and specificity for detecting cancers that we want to know about and can reduce uh, the number of men who are recommended for biopsy. And you may know some of these. Uh, the ones that are commonly used are uh, Prostate Health Index and Opco 4K. Those are blood tests. These others are urine tests. They're all great. They all have great science behind them. And as I will show you, the new screening paradigm, if you have a, a PSA that's worrisome, you should have what we call a reflex test, one of these or one new one that I'm going to tell you about. If you use these tests and you interpret them correctly, and you have someone who's got a PSA of, let's say, six, which could indicate just non-cancerous prostate enlargement or prostate cancer, we don't know, because PSA is prostate-specific and not prostate cancer-specific, you can use one of these tests to better categorize whether or not you're at risk for high-grade cancer and, and whether or not you can avoid a biopsy. So using these tests, we avoid about 30% of prostate biopsies. In Cleveland here, we've been working on a new assay called ISO-PSA, uh, which is not a new kind of PSA, but it's a new way of measuring PSA that's related to cancer in the bloodstream. It increases the specificity for an abnormal test to indicate the presence of cancer. And the way it works is that PSA is a normal protein. Normal prostates make PSA, and normal prostate cells make normal amounts or normal structures of PSA. Cancerous cells, because of their disordered metabolism, make abnormal proteins. And the current PSA assays and those reflex tests that I showed you don't measure those. An ISO-PSA is a way of measuring these cancer-related proteins. And so it's more specific for cancer. So if you have a worrisome ISO-PSA, your likelihood of having cancer and therefore justified being biopsy is a lot higher. And here's how ISO-PSA works. It's just blood in a test tube, and um, the way the secret sauce works is it separates these cancer-related proteins from the normal proteins, and you can, est you can establish a ratio here. So what, does, what do the ratios mean? If you have an ISO-PSA index less than six, you have a 92% chance of not having a cancer that you would want treated. And if your ISO-PS index is greater than six, you have a 50% chance of having a cancer that should be treated. And if you ask most urologists and most patients, if I told you you had a 50-50 chance of having a high-grade cancer, do you want a biopsy or would you recommend a biopsy, 
most people would say yes. That's far better than the, sorry about that. Dave, your, your device is continuing to make noise. Um, anyway, we've been using this, and we did uh, a 900 patient study last year using all our providers, general urologists, advanced practice providers, oncology trained providers. And what we found was that using MRI, using ISO-PSA, so PSA first, then ISO-PSA as a reflex, the number of MRIs that were recommended went down by about 15 to 20 percent, and the number of biopsies that were recommended went down by over half. Isn't that wonderful? So now, this is going to sound strange, but I'm really happy about this. When I recommend someone for a prostate biopsy now, more than 95 percent of the time they have cancer. That's a good thing, because in the past, it was only 50-50. So that is progress, all right? I don't want to biopsy anybody who doesn't have prostate cancer because there's no reason to do a biopsy. So this test, like the others, help us determine who needs a biopsy. So this is the current screening algorithm that I and many of my colleagues use. You have a worrisome or an elevated PSA. We do one of these reflex tests. I have to admit that my favorite is ISO-PSA now because it's easy to do. It's a simple blood test and it's easy to interpret and it, it avoids more biopsies than the other reflex tests that I showed you, which only avoid about 30% of biopsies. It looks like we have very robust data now that shows that we can avoid about half the biopsies. If the ISO-PSA index is elevated, then I do an MRI. And the reason is that MRI makes biopsy better, and I'll show you that uh, in uh, a little bit in a few slides. And if the MRI is negative, then um, Excuse me, if the, if the ISO-PSA is negative, no MRI, just monitoring. If the ISO-PSA is positive, then an MRI, and a biopsy regardless of whether or not the MRI shows a spot or not. And the reason is we've learned that while MRI is great and it makes the average biopsy better, it doesn't see all high-grade cancers. About 20% of high-grade cancers are not seen by MRI. So at least the way I think about this looking at the data, even in someone with a negative MRI, I stand an elevated ISO-PSA or one of the other reflex tests still needs a biopsy. All right, how to do a prostate biopsy. This is really confusing and it is evolving to a new standard. In the past, again going back to when I started my career, I'll tell you what it really used to be like when I started my career in 1981 as a resident at the Cleveland Clinic. Someone who needed a prostate biopsy was admitted to the hospital the night before the biopsy. They were asked to, uh, they got a full set of labs, uh, take a beta iron shower, just like we do for open surgery, got intravenous antibiotics, got general anesthesia in the operating room, and had a needle that was passed through the perineum between, the, that's the, the skin between the testicles and the rectum, that was guided by a finger in the rectum. And about half the patients, the needle went into the bladder, and they got clots, and they ended up needed to stay a second night in the hospital with a catheter. That's what's the state of the art then. Then along came transrectal ultrasound in the mid to late 80s, and that changed everything because it moved prostate biopsy to the outpatient setting where we could do it in a few minutes by putting a probe in the rectum, seeing the prostate, and sticking the needle in the prostate. And that has served us better, than, I was gonna say well, but it served us better than the prior uh, way of doing things for all these decades. What came along a few years ago was MRI, with high quality MRI and radiologists who are really able to read MRIs in a standardized fashion and say, yeah, this area looks like cancer and this area doesn't look like cancer. And we were able to increase the yield by doing targeted biopsies using software that allows us to have a real-time ultrasound image and the stored ultrasound image and fuse them together. That's what the fusion means. So that became the standard a few years ago. Where we are headed now is to a new standard of transperineal biopsy, back to the future kind of thing. But transperineal biopsy done as an outpatient, sometimes under local anesthesia, sometimes under sedation, sometimes under general anesthesia. There are a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, and transperineal biopsy is more comfortable for the patient and has almost no risk of infection. And we don't even use antibiotics for transperineal biopsy. So that's where we're headed. So let me show you why MRI is better. On the left you see an ultrasound picture of a prostate. It's this big gray blob here. And it looks, 
the, the cancers of the prostate generally occur in the peripheral zone here, which looks completely homogenous. So this patient has a cancer, but you can't see it. That was the problem with ultrasound. You can't see where the cancer is. Whereas with MRI, this is a different patient. You can see here in the peripheral zone, there's this dark spot right here that shows us, yeah, that's where the cancer is hiding and that's where you should focus your needle. And that's why the yield has increased so much. And so that's been a real advance. And so this is just a picture of how transrectal biopsy works with the ultrasound probe and the rectum and the needle goes through the rectum. And again, the problem with that is that there is a measurable rate of minor infections and a, about a 1% rate of really serious infections. And this is how transperineal biopsy works. It's basically the same concept where the ultrasound probe goes in the rectum, you see the prostate, but you pass the needle through the skin. And you can do that freehand or you can use a grid. And there are various ways of doing that. And none of that really matters. What matters is what the experience of the person doing the biopsy is and uh, what they're good at. So this is what MRI ultrasound fusion looks like when done either transrectally or transperineally. It doesn't matter. Here is the MR of the prostate that our radiologist has marked in green are the borders of the prostate. And here is the cancer over here, the one that's seen, and that's this one over here. And the cylinders here represent the needle strikes. And you can precisely biopsy the areas that are most likely to have high-grade cancer in them. And then in this particular instance, there were a couple spots over here that weren't seen very well on the MRI. So that is the state of the art. And there's a new state of the art coming, which isn't fully formed yet. This is called micro ultrasound. And unlike the ultrasound picture that I showed you before, a micro ultrasound, which is stronger. So a standard ultrasound probe that we use currently is about eight or nine megahertz. This micro ultrasound is three times more powerful. It's about 29 megahertz. You can see a great deal more detail in the prostate. And here, for example, is an example of um, a lesion in the prostate that looks just like it did on MRI. These biopsies using this machine can be done transrectally or transperineally. And we're not there yet, but we think in the future we may even be able to avoid doing an MRI because micro ultrasound is just as good as MRI if the person doing the ultrasound and the biopsy uh, really learns the system. So this is in progress. There's, to my knowledge, there's one unit in uh, Cleveland, and that's at Fairview Hospital, uh, that um, our uh, urologic oncologist, Rob Abuasli, is uh, using. This will be the new standard in a few years, I think. Um, so more head-to-head -head studies need to be done, but we're headed that way. So uh, for those of you who have had an MRI, even not of the prostate, Avoiding an MRI is a good thing. They're very claustrophobic and noisy, and they're a nuisance to do. All right, let's move on to treatment. Uh, this is data from a couple years ago showing trends in initial management of prostate cancer. We still bucket prostate cancer into low, intermediate, and high risk based on PSA, based on how much cancer we can feel or see on an X-ray based on how much cancer's on biopsy, the grade, all of those sort of things. That, those are relatively imprecise measures, and we're getting to the point where we can better characterize cancers biologically and better assign who needs treatment and who doesn't. But for now, this is where we are, and you can see that for high-risk disease, radiation and surgery are commonly done for intermediate risk disease, same thing. There are a subset of patients with favorable intermediate risk disease who have favorable genomic scores on biopsy, which I'll talk about in a minute, that are candidates for surveillance. And that is emerging data. Not everybody with a grade seven prostate cancer needs treatment. We've learned that. And then the good news is for men with low risk disease, which we find less and less on biopsy because we better select patients for biopsy now. And because using MRI, we can find the high grade cancer. So treatment for low grade cancer is going down and active surveillance is going up. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are the goals that we set out for prostate cancer now. When I just closed my practice about a week ago, but while I was practicing, my goal was to treat only those men who have potentially lethal cancers and put everybody else on active surveillance. That should be the goal. And that's the way um, sophisticated oncologists think about this. And our medical oncologists agree with this. What is active surveillance? It's a management strategy. It's not a treatment. 
And so it means after initial diagnosis, no initial treatment. All right, that's scary to a lot of people who hear the word cancer. But we have learned that low-grade prostate cancer doesn't kill anybody, and it doesn't metastasize, except in very, very rare instances. And we have new tools that I'll talk about that help tell us who's at risk of that and who isn't. So no initial therapy. Serial monitoring to determine if the cancer gets a little worse, because over the course of time, prostate cancer can grow and can turn into one, even though it turns, starts out low grade, can into, turn into something that becomes life-threatening. Just like anybody who's got a benign colon polyp, if that's left untreated, that can turn into a cancer. Some low grade prostate cancers can progress, so you need to be monitored. And then we can cure those people when they progress. Progress is probably not the right term, but when they reach the level where the cancer, um, here's the way I think about it. If you have a cancer that's just treading water in the middle of a pool and not going anyplace, you can ignore it. If it starts swimming, towards the shore and is about to get out of the pool, that's when you want to treat it, and we can do that now. So, how do we pick people for active surveillance? You have to have two things. You have to have the right cancer, and you have to have the right mindset. And you have to be comfortable with the idea that you're gonna have a cancer that's being followed, but the trade-off is no side effects. Remember I said previously, all treatments have side effects, and so it's better to avoid them. So most men that I see at least have the right mindset for active surveillance. So how do we define what I call biologically indolent tumor, low-grade cancers that don't need to be treated? So grade six cancer, uh, some grade seven cancer, that's Gleason's grade group two. None of this stuff, which I won't talk about other than to say you really need an expert pathologist to review your slides to be sure that you don't have these particular features which are not part of the Gleason's grading system. And one of the new things that's gonna come out in the next year or two is that one of our pathologists, Jesse McKenney, has done a great job redefining the Gleason's grading system based on the presence or absence of what's called cribriform histology. And I think that that's going to be another revolutionary step so that when in five years from now, if and, but I believe when that system gets widely adopted, we're only gonna have two categories of prostate cancer. It's gonna be uh, low risk prostate cancer or high risk or favorable or unfavorable and only the unfavorables that need to be treated. And then we look at something called PSA density, which is your blood PSA level divided by the volume of the prostate, which generally, although not necessarily, but generally correlates with the presence of high grade cancer. All right, so let's say you have this and you have the right mindset, what happens next? Usually we do a confirmatory study, an MRI, and a guided biopsy. If your first biopsy was a transrectal uh, ultrasound guided biopsy and a genomic test, and I'll talk about that in a minute. If that's okay, then in six months, digital rectal exam and PSA, biopsy if worrisome, that never happens. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I recommended a biopsy six months after initial diagnosis for a patient. And then a year, usually an MRI again, sometimes biopsy, sometimes not, depends on where the patient started, what their comorbidities are, what their age is, that sort of thing. We've been, we used to biopsy everybody every year. Here's another evolution over 30 years. Now we push the biopsies out to 18 months, sometimes to three years, something like that. And we're working on developing individual tailored strategies for each patient based on what their initial characteristics are. And then that gets repeated, right? So if you do okay at six months, no sign of progression. Do okay at a year, no sign of progression. Then 18 months, 24 months, that sort of thing. The current data suggests in doing that, that about a third of patients avoid uh, treatment, excuse me, about two thirds of patients avoid treatment in the first five years. That's a good thing. As we continue to refine who's a good candidate for surveillance, the number of patients avoiding treatment is going to go up. All right, and we would only treat if the swimmer or the cancer starts swimming toward the edge of the pool. All right, is that clear? That's what surveillance is about. It's a little bit complicated. All right, so there's this raging debate about whether or not MRI or genomic testing is better for choosing patients for active surveillance. And these are, it's always been my view that these are complementary technologies that are not competing technologies. And if, from the patient's point of view, if I'm relying on an expert to make a recommendation about whether or not it's safe for me to follow this cancer and not treat it, 
I want as much information as I can get to make an informed decision. So I usually order both an MRI and a genomic test, and I'll tell you a little bit about the genomic test. Here's why. The MRI helps you see this, right? If there's a shark, a high-grade cancer, circling your life, and the fin is above the water, the MRI will help you see it and find it and target your, um, your needle biopsy. But there's a lot that goes on under the surface. And as I mentioned to you, MRI doesn't see 20% of high-grade cancers. So genomics allow you to look under the surface and see all the garbage that's under there. And they work in a complementary fashion. So my advice to you is, if you're considering active surveillance, you should have both tests, both an MRI and a genomic test, so that you get all the information you need about your cancer. So what's a genomic test? After you've had your biopsy, it's possible for the pathologist to send off a small amount of that cancer to one of the companies that do these tests, and they measure the expression of certain genes that are associated with cancer aggressiveness. If your score is low, then the likelihood of you having an aggressive cancer that's going to threaten your life is very, very low, and I'll explain the data on the slide in a minute. If your score is high, it's likely more likely that the cancer could threaten your life or health and you should be treated. So this is data from um, our original study on one of these genomic tests called Oncotype. And let me say there are a couple on the market. There's Oncotype, there's Decipher, there is Prolaris, and there is Promark. Um, I had a hand in helping to develop three of those. And there's recently published data that suggests, confirms my bias from having worked with, on these markers for 20 years that the best two are Decipher and Oncotype. Okay? That's my personal opinion. It's not scientific fact. But those are the two that I have relied on over the years. So this is data. When we uh, first developed this, we took a cohort of about 500 men who had had radical prostatectomy and been followed for a number of years. And we micro-dissected the tissue and, and figured out that this worked. This is 20-year follow-up data. And this is unique data, because there's no other data like it in here. So what this shows is that at the time you were diagnosed with prostate cancer, these men were diagnosed with prostate cancer, if your what was called the GPS score for Oncotype was below 29, you had a 4% or less risk ever over 20 years of getting metastatic disease and almost a 0% risk of dying of prostate cancer, which is a really strong argument that if you have a low score that, and you don't have any high-grade cancer on your biopsy, that active surveillance is safe. And if your GPS score is above about 30, you can see that the numbers start to rise. So if you're about 35, you have about a 10% risk of getting metastatic disease over 20 years. In my experience, most patients if you quote that risk, would say, yes, I want to be treated to avoid that risk. And if your GPS score is above 30 uh, and you're treated, you only have about a 2% risk of dying. So this is really great data, I think, that shows the value of genomic testing. And here's another nice study that actually was coordinated by uh, our next speaker, Dan Spratt. Dan, I haven't seen you in the audience here yet. If you're here, are you here yet? He'll be here. Um, uh, who published this uh, using the, the other marker, Decipher. And uh, what this showed was that men who had a low Decipher score stayed on active surveillance. So this is the likelihood of, this is everybody starting on active surveillance, and this is the likelihood of needing treatment over time. If you had a low score in the blue here, you were far more likely to stay on surveillance than a high score. What does that mean? It means if you had a low score, your swimmer stayed treading water and was less likely to start going toward the shore. Whereas if you had a high score on biopsy, uh, that was more likely to happen. Here's what's more important and more impressive to me. In patients who started on surveillance and then were treated, if you had a low decipher score, virtually everybody was cured when they were treated. Right? You caught the swimmer before he got out of the pool. Whereas if you had a high decipher score, this indicates people with PSA recurrences afterwards. This is still going down. And what that says to me is that if you have a high score, a high Decipher score, or a high Oncotype score, or a high Prolaris score, or a high Promark score, you need treatment. You should not go on surveillance. That's the main message. None of this existed 15 years ago. And this is another major area of progress in prostate cancer over the course of my career where we understand the biology of the cancer better. All right, what's the best treatment? We could argue about this. 
for a long time. There's a new treatment paradigm coming online called focal therapy. And so the decision tree on whether or not someone needs to be treated is getting more complicated, but I will simplify for you the way I think about that in another slide or so. If you need the whole prostate treatment, these are the standard treatments. They all work great in my view. The cure rates are roughly the same. They all have different side effects. That's a long discussion with your practitioner and your spouse and people at the gathering place, patients who have been through it to decide how to do. There's this new kind of focal therapy where you only treat part of the prostate and you only treat the part of the prostate that has the cancer in it. This has come online because MRI does a better job of telling us where the cancer is and where the cancer isn't. And this is growing. Currently, it's being used, I think, nationally a little too aggressively. Locally, we, at least at the clinic, we've been very conservative about who we treat, and I'll show you that in another slide there. There's one other form of focal therapy on here. Oh, let me say, these are all ways of delivering energy to the prostate to zap the tissue, all right? Think about Star Wars and the laser guns. It's not all laser-based, but it's all energy-based. You've focused energy right on some tissue and cancer, and you can destroy it. There's one, one other uh, focal therapy that I put on here. It's called partial prostatectomy. It's surgical focal therapy, taking out surgically just a part of the prostate. One of my colleagues, Jihad Kayuk, has been working on some very unique ways of doing that. Um, that's outpatient surgery. Here's another major advance in the course of 30 years. When I started doing radical prostatectomy 30 years ago, every patient was admitted to the hospital the day before surgery, just like prostate biopsy, had their day of surgery, stayed in the hospital for a total of nine days, catheter for three weeks, took a year to become continent. Very few men were potent. Now, <clears throat> it's done as an outpatient with robotics, outpatient. Average length of stay in the hospital, four to six hours. Uh, three to five days with a catheter, almost immediate continence in everybody, about a 70% potency rate at two years. Those are real advances over 30 years. And uh, these newer things promise to do even better than that. That sets a high bar. So if you're treated, how are you followed afterwards? The way we follow patients to determine if they have recurrent cancer or cured is with a PSA. With focal therapy, it's a little more complicated than that. It's a little bit more like active surveillance. If you leave the prostate in place and only treat part of it, the rest of the prostate still makes PSA, so your PSA isn't gonna to go to zero. And we know that many prostate cancers occur in multiple places in the prostate, so if you only treat the one you can see, the ones you can't see could grow into something worrisome over time. And so the follow-up for focal therapy is a little more involved. It involves MRI and repeated biopsy and so forth. So this is developing. This, I think, will become an important tool in management for about 10 to 15 percent of patients. No more than that. I don't think it's not going to replace these other treatments. All right, what's focal therapy? So this is a cross-section of a prostate or three different prostates. This one prostate has a solitary tumor. This prostate has two tumors that you see sort of under the blue area. This one has more extensive tumor. And the idea behind focal therapy is just to target the area where the tumor is. One of my colleagues who's no longer in Cleveland has an extensive experience with cryotherapy doing this, what we call subtotal gland ablation or total gland ablation. We followed those patients for 20 years and we see lots of local recurrences 20 years out. So I am not a fan of this particular approach. What I am a fan of now is using one of those therapies, focal therapies that I mentioned on the previous slide, in a very conservative way of just targeting people who have solitary tumors. So when we biopsy this patient, we see cancer here, and we do random biopsies elsewhere, and no cancer there, and we've been targeting that. And that's the about 10 or 15% of patients that we see. So. With all of that, how do we make sense of this and how do, you, how do you address the question, if I'm newly diagnosed with cancer, how should I be treated? All right, so the first question, do I need treatment? That is the first question, right? And if the answer is no, then you go on active surveillance. Why might you not need treatment? Because you have a cancer that's only going to tread water. And that is the number one choice all the time. All right, if the answer is yes, am I a candidate for focal therapy? And uh, then you have to have a discussion with whatever experience your particular medical institution has with focal therapy. It's not clear yet 
if there's a winner here, and there are lots of other different therapies coming online yet. So there's no clear winner here. And if the answer is no, which whole gland treatment best suits my needs? Okay, and that's the way I think about it. I'll leave that up for a minute so you can think about it. And that's how it works. All right, what about what we call now moving into metastatic disease? Remember I pointed out to you that there's a 30-year survivor in the room who had uh, a lymph node metastasis. We call that oligo, which means few metastatic disease. So we have patients like this who present with metastatic disease. They have cancer everywhere. I once saw a patient early in my career who had cancer all throughout his skeleton. He was 70 years old. He could barely walk. His PSA was 10,000. It's the highest I've ever seen. He was treated with Lupron. He lived for 15 years, and he died of something unrelated to his prostate cancer. He was one of those real outliers. That's not the usual. But we do see patients like this, and about 30% of them survive five years. And we see patients like this who have localized disease, but more and more with new imaging, we see patients who have cancer in the prostate and just one or two spots of cancer elsewhere. We call that oligometastatic disease. We used to lump these patients in with these patients, and that's clearly not the right thing to do. It's clear now that with a more aggressive approach, both to the primary tumor here and to the metastases, that we might be able to cure some of these patients, and I'll show you an example of that. <clears throat> but we think even if we don't cure them, we can make them live longer, although they have to live with side effects of medications. What has allowed this to happen are better imaging and better treatments for metastatic disease, a bunch of drugs that I'll talk about in a minute. So if we see a patient like this, we are becoming more aggressive in recommending systemic treatment for the metastases with medication and local treatment with radiation or surgery for the prostate. And the idea here is to think about the metastases and the primary cancer as two separate cancers and direct the best therapy that we have at each of them. So for the primary tumor, that's going to be surgery or radiation. For low volume lymph node metastases in the pelvis, that could be surgery or radiation. For more bulky metastatic disease in the abdomen, if it's all just in the lymph nodes, that would be surgery. And then for metastatic disease, the standard things we use for metastatic disease, which is androgen deprivation therapy with an androgen blocker and radiation, particularly to bony sites. That kind of aggressive approach seems to work, and here's the example. This was a patient that I saw about 10 years ago. <clears throat> he presented with blood in his sperm. He had a rock-hard prostate. He had a Gleason's grade 9 cancer on biopsy. And he had this CT scan which showed this lymph node up here, that one solitary lymph node, which was biopsied and proven to be prostate cancer. And I and my medical oncology team told him, you have metastatic cancer, you need to go on hormone treatment. Your survival at five years is about 30%. So he was a bright man. He went to Sloan Kettering in New York and saw a medical oncologist named Howard Shear, who I credit for thinking about this paradigm and teaching us that it's possible and opening up our ideas. Howard put him on androgen deprivation therapy for six months. His PSA went to zero. He had a pelvic lymph node dissection, a radical prostatectomy. Uh, a few months later, he cropped up with this one bone lesion right here, which was treated with radiation. He's 10 years out now, and he has no sign of cancer. And he's not on androgen deprivation, and he has a normal testosterone level. So that's one patient with another patient with metastatic disease who's been cured. And so we have several examples of that. The question is, if we can cure a few people like that, why can't we cure everybody? So this whole field is exploding now. This is a nice paper that Howard and his team did in men with oligometastatic disease that showed that if you treat them with hormone therapy alone, the likelihood of getting a zero PSA, which we equate with the potential for cure, you know, was under 40%. If you treat them with androgen deprivation and surgery, it's about 75%. If you use a very aggressive approach, androgen deprivation, surgery, and radiation, then you're starting to see that almost 100% of those patients get a PSA that goes to zero. That doesn't guarantee that they're cured, but it means that after treatment, they have no sign of cancer, and then you can monitor them. So that's another exciting advance, a change in thinking over the past 10 years or so on that. All right, what if you have metastatic disease? How do you get treated? The next two slides are a little overwhelming because there are so many options. These are all the different options for hormone treatment. 
And these are all the other non-hormonal systemic therapies. And there's no way that as a layperson without a medical background that you can make sense of this. And so I'm gonna try and simplify it for you. But my advice to you is if you have metastatic prostate cancer, go see an expert who understands the ins and outs of all these different treatments and can give you the best advice. So this is a very slight oversimplification of how we look at treating metastatic prostate cancer. There are lots of individual variations, but this is the basic idea, sort of the spine that we grow everything out on. For initial therapy, if you have metastatic disease, it's castration, getting rid of the testosterone that's made by the testicles, and androgen blockade, getting rid of the testosterone that's made by the adrenal glands. And we do that with drugs, usually. So that's an LHRH agonist or antagonist. So that's Degarelix, Lupron, Elagard, Zolodex, Trellstar, any of those drugs, they're all the same. And a drug called Abiraterone or androgen receptor blockers, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide. <clears throat> In my opinion, those three drugs work the same. It doesn't matter which one you take. The side effect profile is a little different. There is some evidence that starting with abiraterone rather than one of these is better, and then you can always use one of these later. Okay, so our medical oncology team, first choice is castration with Lupron, usually, or Elagard, whatever's on the shelf, and then abiraterone, all right? If you have really extensive metastatic disease, like that gentleman I mentioned with the PSA of 10,000, today he would not have been treated with Lupron alone. He would have gotten chemotherapy with docetaxel. So if you have really extensive disease, disease in the lungs, disease in the liver, big lymph node disease, that sort of thing, it's gonna be Lupron or one of the congeners and maybe one of these drugs and chemotherapy, all right? There are lots and lots of variations here, again, so generally speaking, if you start on one regimen and you progress, you move to something new, which order you get it in, which drug is best, all of that is just too complicated to explain and seek out uh, expert advice on that. All right, some really new things that are really, 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 really exciting. You may hear more detail about this from Dr. Spratt and Dr. Ponsky. One are PSMA PET scans. PSMA is, an, is a molecule made by prostate cancer that we can now image using monoclonal antibodies. This has been in development for about 20 years. And uh, this is a PSMA PET scan in uh, a patient uh, who's got a spot in the bone there, and a spot in the bone there, and a spot in the bone there, and spots in bones here. And I don't think this patient had any lymph node metastases, but this will now be used for patients with really high-grade cancers before they get their prostatectomy or their radiation to see if they have metastatic disease. It will be used in patients after radiation or surgery who have a rising PSA to figure out where their cancer is and whether additional spot therapy to that area can be delivered. And really remarkably, it's gonna be used for therapy, and I'll show you that in a minute, but let me show you a diagnostic dilemma. This is a patient that I operated on about two years ago. He had uh, Gleason 7 prostate cancer. He had a bone scan, an MRI, and a CT scan prior to surgery. No evidence of metastatic disease. Took out his prostate. If you remove all the cancer when you take out the prostate, his PSA should go to zero. It didn't. It went to about 0.5, then 0.7, something like that. Repeated the MRI, repeated the bone scan, both negative. Did a PSMA PET scan, and we found this hot spot right here in one rib. He had one spot in the rib here, which you can see this dark spot right here, and this dark spot right here. It was missed by conventional imaging. So he had what we call this oligometastatic disease. So he got a brief course of, of hormone treatment and was radiated to the rib, and he's about a year out now, and his PSA is undetectable because we found this cancer, the residual cancer, we're able to treat it. That is the way PSMA PET is going to revolutionize what we do. Here's another way. This is even more exciting. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a sore throat. <clears throat> this is called Theranostics, diagnosis and treatment all in the same. It's possible to take this PSMA monoclonal antibody 
and linked to it a radioactive molecule called lutetium, <clears throat> which kills cancer. And the monoclonal antibody serves as a homing mechanism to take the radioactivity in high dose right to the cancer. So this is a publication from Europe. This is not available in the United States. Let me say diagnostic PSMA scanning is now available uh, in the United States in many places, including many places here in Cleveland. This is not yet FDA approved. It's under study in the United States. It is available in certain places in Europe and Australia. So look at all the dots in this patient here. This is all metastatic prostate cancer that expresses PSMA. So this patient was treated with this combination of PSMA and lutetium. So this is February 2016. <clears throat> this is October. All the dots are gone. The PSA went to zero. And this is uh, almost another year out. This patient is free of cancer. This therapy is really exciting because it holds the potential to be able to cure men who have really extensive metastatic disease. So I'm really optimistic that this 30% five-year survival for men with metastatic disease that exists currently is going to increase based on this kind of therapy. This is really exciting. All right, a couple closing thoughts. <clears throat> I love this cartoon. How many of you have done 23andMe or Ancestry or one of those things? Any of you? Really? Yes? Show of hands? No? I see a few head nods. Okay, you can have your whole genome sequence for about $1,000 and uh, learn a lot about the genes that you were born with and various disease states and so forth. So that was science fiction 21 years ago when this appeared in the New Yorker. This is a woman going to the pharmacist with a prescription saying, here's my, you know, here's my sequence. This is not science fiction anymore. We can sequence using genomic tests on biopsy. This is almost standard of care for all solid uh, metastatic cancers now. If you have a metastasis, to have a piece of that tumor sent off to Foundation Medicine or one of the other companies and have it sequenced to find targeted therapy, that sort of thing. What's even more exciting than that, since that's not science fiction anymore, is what's called liquid biopsy. It is possible now to find DNA and other substances in your bloodstream or in the bloodstream of a patient with cancer that indicate the presence of cancer and indicate targets for treatment and how you're responding to treatment. And so that is going to change everything we do about cancer. I've been working with a company called Grail that has developed a blood test called Gallery a blood test, a single blood draw, that can detect more than 50 kinds of cancers. Doesn't do very well for prostate cancer, interestingly, but it does very well for other kinds of cancers, including things like ovarian and pancreatic cancer. Five to 10 years from now, that's gonna be part of routine blood work for all of us as a routine screen for cancer. It will supplement and maybe, 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 I say, replace the need for a colonoscopy or mammography. We don't know that for sure. It's all based on a blood test and sequencing. How do we use it for cancer? This is specifically for prostate cancer. This is a nice study that was just published this week from a company called Epic Sciences, where each of these represents a single cell in a sample of blood. And um, you can look at different markers. So this is just a generic marker that says, yeah, this is a cell. This is a marker that says, yeah, it could be a cancer cell. This is a marker that says it's a white blood cell. And this is a marker that says, this is a cancer cell, a prostate cancer, that, has, uh, that is overexpressing what's called the androgen receptor, which means that this patient is different than this patient and this patient. These patients have standard prostate cancer that can be treated with the usual drugs. This patient, one cell out of about a dozen that can be seen there, it's very apparent that they need more aggressive therapy. And what's really impressive about this is that you can do it on a serial basis. So you start before treatment, see how many of these cells you have in the bloodstream, you start treatment, you see if these cells go away, and you monitor the patient periodically, and you see if new cells with different resistant patterns emerge. Liquid biopsy is gonna change everything we do. So let me just close here with the statistic that I showed you before. Of all cancers that are out there, prostate cancer has the best five-year survival. Be optimistic about that. Thanks again for the opportunity to present here, and uh, if we have time, I'm happy to take a few questions.
lot of information, but presented in such an understandable way, which we always appreciate. Um, and so I know we have one question so far. Well, I wrote down one. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. As well. So we'll do a couple of questions, sure. and then we will be able to go on the next one. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We, it's always great to hear you speak, uh, and I hope your retirement isn't going to deter you from coming back the next time we do this. Um, so a first question I had on the ISO PSA. Yes. Is that ready for prime time now? Yeah, ISO PSA is ready for prime time. We use it all the time routinely. Um, it's not FDA approved yet, but okay. we're hoping for that in the first quarter so uh, of next year. So yes, it's ready for prime time. Okay, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, PSMA okay. testing. Yes. Uh, how are you uh, feeling this out as far as the insurance yeah. coverage and all of that? Because it is on the NCCN guidelines yeah. now, which is great, but yeah. that doesn't mean they're going to pay for it. Right? Um, yes. Do we, do we have any insurance sponsors here? <laughs> you should invite them. All right. In, in all of health care, the insurers are the bad guys. I don't mind saying that. All right. Just before I went on vacation, right after PSMA PET was approved and available, I ordered about a dozen. I went on vacation. I got back. All of them were denied. All of them. So uh, insurance companies are always slow to adopt new technology, even when it's the right thing to do for patients. So my understanding is we think Medicare is going to liberalize their coverage determinations in January. But in the meantime, it's still going to be an individual fight with each insurance company and what their guidelines say about its use. So we'll fight that out. Yeah. Lee, has that been your experience also? Yeah. Same. It's all the new technology yeah. seem to be. Okay, and really another great hot topic is that genetic testing that you referred to at the end of your talk. You mentioned, and the question from the audience actually you did answer in terms of the serial testing yep. and the, the benefit to that. Yep. When you see a patient new to your practice, when would you recommend in the trajectory of their diagnosis and so forth, when would you recommend that to start? Yeah, it's getting to be standard of care in patients who present with metastatic disease, okay. right, at baseline. Mm -hmm. uh, both blood and uh, sequencing of the primary tumor or metastatic cancer. So that should be done probably in everybody. The serial monitoring part isn't probably ready for prime time yet, but will be coming. Talking to a lot of companies about looking at serial monitoring in the blood for what's called minimal residual disease. Mm -hmm. So you have, let's say you have a high-grade prostate cancer, you get treated with radiation or surgery, and your PSA goes to zero, but we know from experience that you're at risk for recurrence, and PSA is not sensitive to pick that up. Should we be doing blood tests in that space to pick up early recurrences and so forth? Also, again, not ripe yet, but is coming. So uh, getting back to the difference between actual tissue testing yeah. and liquid biopsy, yeah. can you speak a little bit about the specificity? Sure. And, uh, uh, I would imagine, I'm just guessing, that the tissue biopsy would be superior to the liquid biopsy, but can you comment on that? Yeah, um, it actually isn't, and the reason is there are two separate issues. One is from a convenience standpoint. It's far easier to get a blood test than it is to do a biopsy, right? So that's part of it. The second is that a tumor has heterogeneity in it, so what the biopsy samples may not be completely representative of what's in the tumor, because it could have missed one clone of cells. And so at least theoretically, liquid biopsy is a better way of assessing the entire tumor because the entire tumor should shed DNA or cells into the bloodstream. Published studies show good correlation but not perfect head-to-head -head comparing tissue and uh, liquid biopsy. It's probably in the range of 80 to 90 percent depending upon what test is used. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And let me just say one other thing. One other challenge in prostate cancer is that the predominant place of metastasis is bone. It's hard to get high quality tumor out of bone to do sequencing. So it's unlike other solid tumors. So liquid biopsy is probably going to play a bigger role in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to make one other comment because I see this guy sitting here. One of the, I mentioned androgen deprivation therapy and Lupron and Trellstar and so forth, and I forgot to mention there's a new drug on the market which I'm actually quite enthusiastic about. It's called Orgovix, or regu, how, do you, how do you pronounce the generic? What? 
regu yeah, you know, you got to come up with regugolix. It's an oral Lupron equivalent. And what's nice about it is that it drops testosterone very quickly. And when you stop it, testosterone rebounds. So we're going to see, I think, a reemergence of an old therapy that fell out of favor called intermittent hormone therapy for certain patients. And the idea is that when you're on hormone therapy, you feel lousy because you don't have any testosterone, but that's what's keeping the, the cancer under control. And so a long time ago, a guy named Brukowski invented uh, intermittent hormone therapy where we would have patients be on hormones for a while, stop it, feel better, but their cancer, you know, the PSA went up and they went back on it. The problem with that is that it takes a long time after you stop Lupron or one of those drugs for testosterone to come back. Um, but uh, with Orgovix, it bounces back pretty quickly. And so in the recent past, I've been putting patient, more patients on intermittent therapy. It also seems to be safer for patients who have cardiovascular disease. So sorry I didn't mention that during the talk. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right.